I'll do it. Okay. Um, hi, everyone. Um, sorry about the, the bit of a delay there, um, but I'm so glad everyone could join us today. I have the distinct pleasure of introducing our speaker today. Um, my name is Monica Granados. I am a board member of the Canadian Open Data Society. We're doing a series of webinars, and today we have the pleasure of having John Kahn, who is a lawyer but is also a PhD researcher at the Osgood Hall Law School at York University. I first connected with John on Twitter. He had this uh, tweet that came up on my timeline that recognized the fact that we don't know a lot about our legal system here in Canada, especially when you put it in contrast to what's happening in the United States. So I reached out to him and asked, hey, would you like to do something with the Canadian Open Data Society? And uh, to our great pleasure, he agreed. And so um, hopefully this will be the first in a series of um, webinars with uh, our esteemed guest, John, um, who is going to talk to you today about Canada's legal data deficit. And uh, there's going to be a hands-on component later on as well. So now I'm going to pass it over to John, and uh, thanks again, everyone, for joining. Uh, thanks so much for that introduction, and thanks for having me today as well. So in the next uh, 20 to 25 minutes, here's some of the information that we are going to be covering, going to walk through a little bit of how I got to where I'm going about the lack of deliberate design in our legal system, the legal data deficit in Canada, and a brief discussion about what our neighbors are doing to address some of these problems before turning to the data sprint for today. So I became extremely interested in judicial decision writing while working as a law clerk for six judges at the British Columbia Supreme Court seven years ago. And a law clerk's responsibilities depend a lot on the judge for whom they work, but most law clerks edit decisions, do research, generally act as a sounding board for judges. The main goal is making sure that judges' decisions are correct, accurate, and reliable. And clerking provided me a very different legal education than the one that I received in law school. Helping judges reach just results grounded in the correct law, clear writing, and sound reasoning was very gratifying but I was consistently seeing innumerable people suffer because of judicial delay, judicial inconsistency and legal inconsistency and unworkable legislation and case law that judges and litigants both struggled to understand. And the more I looked at how the court system actually worked, the more confused I started to become. Many aspects of the decision writing process and the decision making process seem divorced from efficiency, consistency, predictability, and a lot of modern cognitive science about good decision making. And the longer I worked in that courthouse, the more I thought Canadians would be shocked to learn, like I was being shocked, about how their legal system worked or really how it didn't work. And this view didn't start to change when I started practicing law. I initially thought it might, but the more I started practicing law, the more I started believing that despite the efforts of our judges and our governments, our legal system was largely failing. As a clerk and as a young lawyer, I spent a lot of time reading judicial decisions. It's mostly what a litigator does. They're getting ready to offer an opinion to a client or get ready for court. And I started to realize that these documents, which are supposed to be providing legal consistency and providing the rule of law in Canada, um, were really incredibly inconsistent. And to use kind of a simple metaphor, decision writing is often like a game of broken telephone where each time a judge applies a legal proposition, they put their own spin on it. And over time, those spins create inconsistency, unpredictability, delay, expense, and at the end of the day, very noisy data. And I started to believe in, in around 2016, 2017, that the way that judges make and write decisions was actually contributing to quite a few problems in our legal system and in some ways Canadian democracy itself since the ju judiciary is you know a large part of the way that Canadian democracy works. 
So I decided that I was going to leave full-time practice and begin my master's degree. And I wanted to study if and how judicial decisions contribute to problems in our legal system, and then discover how might we improve judicial decision-making and judicial decisions. And my overall goal is improving the legal system and to the extent that the legal system supports our democracy, our democracy as well. And my mental model was that decisions had become longer and more complicated and that judges were taking longer and longer to issue them. But when I went out to look for data on the subject, I discovered that no such data existed aside from the Supreme Court of Canada and maybe one or two other select courts, but historical data on the subject simply didn't exist. And this data deficit, really the main point of our discussion today in the data sprint, has now become a large part of my research and my expertise. But before getting to that topic, I'll tell you a little bit about what I discovered in my master's degree as that research guides my current project. And to explore my mental model, I did three things in my master's research. First, I looked at the history and theory of judicial decisions and decision making in the UK's common law as that common law is the genesis of our common law and much of what the UK did um, is still very pervasive in what Canada does now. And much to my surprise, I discovered that these written decisions that are the cornerstone of our, our common law, they actually appear to have evolved in response to Parliament's increasing power in the late 18th and 19th century. And the published accurate written decision that we have now really was the late 19th century attempt by the judiciary and bar to legitimize what was previously an oral common law, where judges would pass down the law, mostly in oral decisions. And they were seeking to make judicial decisions a lot more like statutes. Put another way, and this is kind of startling to me, that the written judicial decision really arose out of a rivalry between judges and parliamentarians. Clearly judges succeeded, those decisions are now a part of our legal system. But this history is really quite important. It shows one of the themes in my research that there is really no deliberate design to how judges write and make decisions. And much of the chaos in how we report law and how we consume it, as well as many other problems in our legal system, make quite a bit of sense with this knowledge. The second thing I did was create a data set of just under 5,000 cases from all reported trial decisions from the British Columbia Supreme Court in 1980, 2000, and 2018. But because most Canadians can't actually bulk access judicial decisions and use some kind of automated process to get the data you need, I had to hand code my 17 variables of interest. And what I discovered was that BC trial judges today are taking three times as long to issue decisions that are three times longer than their colleagues in 1980. And I believe that's probably true in more provinces than just British Columbia. I then discovered some other trends related to subject matter and trial length. And then I used machine learning models to predict what are the features of at least my data set that seem to suggest that a decision will be longer or slower. And this historical evolution is also quite important. It shows that our legal system is having the opposite trend of the medical system, at least in British Columbia. In many cases, medical procedures are now more consistent, hospital stays are shorter, and outcomes are better. We clearly can't say the same about our legal system. Outcomes are less consistent, decisions are longer, and the actual time it takes to move litigation through the court system is way slower than it was in 1980. The last main thing that I did was I surveyed all Canadian courts to get a pulse on how courts view decisions and to see what courts might be doing to address what I perceive to be rather apparent problems with judicial decisions. For example, are they exploring how standardization might improve outcomes in the legal system, but also analysis of the issues in the legal system, much like how standardization is continuing to improve the aviation and medical sectors. And that survey demonstrated that Canadian courts' views on these topics are far from homogenous. Courts have divergent views, but most courts view standardization as quite problematic because of the concept of judicial independence. And I have some later research on that that suggests that a lot of courts' fears are unfounded, but at least for now, many courts are not actually pursuing much standardization in the way that judges write and issue decisions. One of the other things I tried to do in that survey was see if Canadian judges would actually track their workflow anonymously. And there was previous Australian research on this that demonstrated how overworked our judges are, how understaffed courts are, and how much time judges actually spend on out-of-court work versus in-court work. 
But court's views on this topic were quite homogenous. No Canadian court was willing to facilitate the anonymous tracking of time, even though there was going to be a system set up and that there was ethics review done for this. It just was not something that they were willing to do. And this is also quite an important finding. It showed that courts don't seem to view transparency in the same way that we might. But it also might explain why we have this paucity of data in our legal system. And based on this empirical evidence, this history, and these my theoretical findings, I concluded that much of the way that judges write and issue decisions um, likely doesn't further the way that Canadians access justice. Rather, it might actually hinder the way that we access justice. So I argued that courts and judiciary should really find better methods to redesign aspects of judicial decisions and aspects of the legal process. And one key way of doing so would be relying on more standardization. I'm now continuing that same project in um, my PhD research, which is currently titled The Absence of Deliberate Design in Canada's Legal System. And my current task is generating more quantitative and qualitative data about our legal system and then using that data to fuel potential suggested reforms. So in terms of what I'm doing right now with data, I'm currently compiling a data set of all publicly available superior courts. So in Canada, we start at the provincial level and all those courts largely operate on a provincial basis. My research mainly looks at courts that are funded or at least the judiciary is, is appointed by the federal government. So I'm looking at all publicly available superior, appellate and federal courts, common law decisions from 2018. It will be a data set of about 13,000 decisions. I'm gonna use that data for both descriptive and predictive studies and also make my data and the code that I use to gather it open access. And my descriptive goal is really generating descriptive information about court and judicial output. Um, how long does it take a judge to issue decisions? What's the average decision length? How are judges actually analyzing issues? So looking at the structure of decisions and then also looking at the rates of appeals. How often are decisions appealed and what are the ways in which people are actually successful? We currently don't have this status quo benchmark uh, for our judges in 2021. That seems to be a huge shortcoming because as I'll discuss later, we really don't have um, aside from anecdote, much information to offer judges about how they should be offering justice to Canadians. And then going to use this data to again run machine learning models to predict what does lead to long, slow, complex, and appealed decisions. Um, in terms of my quantitative data, I'm also doing some large scale surveys of Canadian judges, as well as the people who read decisions and interact with decisions, and finally, the people who decisions actually affect. And in comparison to the United States, where again, they have data on this the length and complexity, their data says it's a longstanding problem. Much of what we know about how our judges write decisions and how people read decisions is really based on anecdote. And this is quite problematic because Canadian judges are supposed to be writing for the public as a whole. And many judges say they're writing for the losing party, but much of what they know and we know is largely just based on anecdote. So my surveys are really seeking to fill that gap and have some empirical answers to the questions of who are judges writing for, what should decisions actually include, are people happy with the decisions they're receiving, and, and issues like that. I then hope to use that data combined with theoretical and doctrinal principles as well as modern principles of cognitive science and psychology to design some prototypes for decisions that judges might be willing to test. And a key goal of such prototypes would be finding more deliberate user-focused solutions to ensure that decision-making is consistent, predictable, timely, and less prone to error, including heuristics and cognitive bias. And then actually improving the structure of decisions so it's more accessible for anyone who wants to read it, the actual content, the timeliness, the length, and also the data richness of decisions. Most decisions actually don't include much metadata right now. So if someone wanted to do, for example, a large scale study on you know, sentencing and compare different features of age, gender, and race, uh, much of that study would be almost impossible unless someone went and individually read the decision and tagged the individual metadata points. My research suggests that we can do that at the front end so that more empirical research can happen um, at the back end. In short, really what I'm trying to do is design improvements for our legal system with a particular focus on judges and their decisions.
So a common phrase from a lot of advocates, scholars, and lawyers is that our legal system was designed by lawyers for lawyers. And I, I clearly disagree with that thesis, I think based on the last couple of minutes of what I've been saying. And to be fair to the people with whom I disagree, I wanna be clear about what I mean by design. I'm attempting to word, use the word design like uh, a designer or an engineer. So software designers and hardware engineers couldn't build the software or hardware that I'm relying on to communicate right now without a deliberate tested design. Their designs likely relied on interdisciplinary methods, ideation, prototypes, iteration, and user consultation throughout the design process. Their likely goal was truly understanding a user like myself and providing me the best possible experience a key principle of design. In contrast though, no research or evidence suggests that most aspects of our legal system rely on any deliberate design. We can't say that our courts, our judges, or lawmakers truly understand the legal system's users, nor can we say that they're trying to give users the best possible user experience. In reality, most aspects of our legal system unintentionally and organically evolved based on a combination of rebellion, colonialism, precedent, tradition, feeling, and inertia. And I think this history and current reality makes sense, and it likely explains many of the problems in our legal system. Nobody would ever sit down and design our current legal system or really many aspects of our democracy to operate like it does. Our courts have clearly struggled to operate during the COVID-19 pandemic and the pandemic brought a considerable amount of new attention to our court system and some of the problems that I've been discussing. But really our court system struggled to operate long before COVID. Crisis plagued it with chronic judge shortages, frequently canceled hearings, quite a bit of systemic delay, and serious concerns have been leveled against our legal system by academics and our own Supreme Court. The system has been called complacent, slow, overwhelmingly expensive, inconsistent, and a myriad of other problems. Some, including myself, would say that we have an access to justice crisis. And typically, if you go to most modern conversations, or if you enter a modern conversation about our legal system, you're going to hear that term access to justice. And I've already alluded to it today, but the term is really quite fuzzy. And this slide explains what I think it means based on what the concept means elsewhere, but also based on what our constitution promises. Our Supreme Court has been very clear that Canadians, all Canadians have a constitutional right to go to a court and access justice. But whether the system is working well is an empirical question. And I believe that Canadians are entitled to transparent empirical answers, as well as data-driven metrics of success and justice within our legal system. They're also entitled to speedy, accurate, predictable, consistent, cost-effective, fair outcomes. I say few unpredictable results and mostly consistent results because, of course, novel situations are going to arise. But the small L liberal rule of law promise, as well as the Canadian constitutional rule of law promise, is that Canadian law must be predictable and consistent. So legal outcomes should also be predictable and consistent. For most Canadians, though, especially marginalized, racialized, and Indigenous ones, access to justice is really largely a myth. In the words of former Chief Justice Beverly McLaughlin, access to justice is the most important issue facing the legal system today because of all the deficits that are currently um, being encountered by individuals in the legal system. And despite these many problems, and this is something that I find truly um, perplexing, is that my experience and research has led me to a really simple conclusion about our legal system. While laws change, the way that judges and our legislatures make decisions largely are not. They're continuing to do what they've mostly done since the legal system's inception, line reaction, intuition, tradition, ideology, and anecdote. And I think a key reason for this inertia is Canada's legal data deficit. We have an incredible deficit about our legal system and many of the common legal issues that Canadians face every day. We know more about sports teams than we do about individuals in the legal system and the key actors in our legal system. This deficit hampers our ability to understand the legal system's users in contrast to, say, a software designer. And it also really precludes implementing user-focused, data-driven reforms. 
In contrast to many other jurisdictions, and we'll discuss some of them in a moment, empirical information about our judges, litigants, and legal disputes is non-existent. We don't know the Canadian divorce rate nationally, and we don't even know the national rate of guilty pleas, both of which are ready and available statistics in other jurisdictions. We have so many gaps in our knowledge that really impact the capacity for reform. The empirical basis for decision-making about our legal system really pales in comparison to what we know about our health and education systems. We have a long way to go. Most of the feedback on the legal system's functionality is, again, based on anecdote. The lack of reliable statistics obviously impedes progress, a proper functioning legal system, and Canadian democracy itself. We can't really deliberately reform our legal system, reduce ideological divides or partisan reactionary decision-making if we don't actually improve our legal data. Our common law neighbors have already started recognizing many of the points that I've been discussing today. Canadian courts and government's current views and practices, however, really appear to lag behind views, practices, and initiatives in our common law neighbors of New Zealand, the United States, the UK, and Australia, including transparency and open source data initiatives, reliance on human-centered design to ensure courts are meeting user needs and actually knowing what user needs are, data gathering and data-driven reforms, and big collaborations between the judiciary, governments, and external stakeholders. To note a couple comparisons, in comparison to New Zealand, very few Canadian courts publish any empirical data or any annual report. In comparison to the United States, Canada has no aggregated database for good data on its legal system aside from some incomplete statistics by Stats Canada. And they're improving, but they include a lot of missing data and a lot of data that's really not amenable to empirical analysis. We have no database on our judges or their demographic information. That data is very readily available in the United States and quite rich. Almost no public information about how our judges are trained or what training sessions they attend or even the materials that they receive in those training sessions. Those are all um, not for public consumption in Canada. And no public list on slow judges. In the United States, they have what's called the six month list for certain federal courts. And all judges who have decisions that are lasting longer than six months or outstanding are um, put on that public list. In comparison to the United Kingdom, Canadian courts are often very underfunded and relying on dated IT systems. And this point is a pretty well known in the legal community that court requests for funding to provincial attorneys general are often just flat out ignored and denied. So at times people want to blame um, judges or courts for the current approach and deficits, but really often it's a, it's a funding problem or a lack of executive administration autonomy and autonomy. And finally, in comparison to Australia, Canadian courts and judges are really not very transparent. While some empirical study has occurred and many courts and judges have been willing historically to offer um, interview time to certain you know, sociological or political science researchers, on the whole, Canadian courts and judges are quite reticent about participating in studies of their behavior. One has to question what they're afraid of discovering versus looking at um, someone studying their behavior and their practices as a way of improving it and holding more accountability and improving their impartiality. So here's where um, you come in and here's where I think what Monica mentioned at the outset is something that I'm quite interested in doing is um, generating a list of all the empirical research that academics have already done in Canada about our legal system. In contrast to the United States again, or some other places in the world, we don't really have a list in terms of an aggregated list for existing data sets on uh, our legal system. And I'm not sure whether Canadian academics have similar trends towards their work as courts, but often in the States, data sets are open and public and posted. And that's obviously something that's happening more in science, but it still doesn't happen enough in the legal system. And you might say, well, why does this matter? Right now, we don't have a quick and ready way of knowing who's done what in Canada and what's not been done. And if researchers and Canadians don't know, the government might not also know. So they don't actually have a way of relying on more empirical evidence when they're making decisions. For example, I had no idea that researchers had started tracking the policing of COVID-19 across Canada with open data and open code 
only discovered that when I started participating for this talk. Um, in terms of how uh, this project will work, I have an open Google Sheet that I'll show in a moment. Um, and then we can proceed to try and find some sources together. And if you're interested, you can proceed to um, support me in this effort by continuing to participate after um, today's sprint ends. Unless you have institutional academic access, the main way that you normally find academic articles or academic data sets would be either using Google, um, the SSRN academic, um, which is an open access database, and Google Scholar. And if you have academic access, the other search engines would be Hain Online, JSTOR, Legal Track, Westlaw Advance, and LexisNexis. And ideally, authors would be noting things like empirical data or data set in their articles. So you would need that search term, and you could start each search stream like I've done in this slide. Both Google and Google Scholar work with natural language processing, but using Boolean searches is a way to generate more precise lists. So the way that I have these search terms broken down on the slide with the quotation mark around empirical data and the capitalized or in between and then closed by brackets, lets Google know that you're interested in any of those words first and then capitalized and in Canada and capitalized and and the last portion would be the kind of data that I'm interested in. And I've tried out a couple of these and there are definitely data sources to be found here that I haven't previously found. Um, and this is a way of proceeding through to actually try to um, find and uncover some of the existing sources of data. I'll drop some um, links in the chat here for the Google Sheet. And some search tips for the Boolean searching that I've been mentioning. And Richard, Monica, and Paul, I'm in your hands on whether you think it's best to use breakout rooms or to just stay together in one big room and for me to answer questions as, as we proceed. Uh, Paul here. I, you know, I think we've got a tight little group here, and uh, I'd love to have your uh, feedback available to everybody while we have this Google Sheet on the screen. So uh, why don't we stick together for the time being at least? Uh, does Richard, Monica, uh, do you agree? Sounds great. Excellent. Works for me. All right, lead us away, uh, Jonathan. All right, so the um, Google Sheet here is pretty self-explanatory. There's an author name here, there's a title. Ideally, I'd be looking for the URL of where the paper is located. Sometimes it won't be accessible. Um, there's the desc brief description of the data set here. And then if individuals um, did find a data set, then I would be looking to have the author's email because eventually I'm gonna be emailing these authors and offering either host their data or just leave it as um, a source on my, my webpage. This is a drop down menu here that lists all the potential different types of data sets. Um, and on the next page here on features, it explains what these um, different categories are. And in terms of what the end product is like for me, as mentioned, I'm, I'm planning on hosting it all on my, my publicly available you know, website and different entries would exist like this where it notes, okay, here's what this article is. Here's a supporting data set of the different observations. And here's the author name and the different um, article title. As you can see, I have a lot of areas that I'd like to go through and find, but this is another interesting one that I discovered this week. Again, had I not um, started pursuing this task, I wouldn't have discovered this, and this is my research area. So I think there's a lot of information um, that exists out there to be found, and it would be great to have it in an aggregate format. Are there any other questions about the, the, a good way to proceed here, or should we should we get going with trying to find some sources? I think there actually is a question in the chat. So why don't we address questions? Okay. And then sure. what I think we'll do is like some uh, uh, quiet time where people can go out and use all this great information that you just provided to find that information, and then we'll uh, reconvene. But uh, first, Leah, I think we saw um, a question here from uh, Chris in the audience. The question is, uh, uh, does the U.S. have any legislative or policy requirements to release this data? 
So the U.S. has some legislative requirements, specifically about that six-month list that I mentioned in some of their federal rules of civil procedure. And then in terms of policy, um, between all the state courts and the federal courts, most of the time the chief justices have sat down and basically exchanged a memorandum of understanding between a national center and the various courts. Um, we have memorandums of understanding in Canada, but they often leave the complete gathering and tracking of data to the court. And then often the court, um, if you turn around and ask the provincial attorneys general for it, they'll point you back to the court. And then often the court doesn't even respond. So what's happened in the States is that the memorandum of understanding exists in a way that the court actually funnels data to some of these national state centers. And I was on a call last week where um, US courts in particular, Texas and Michigan actually just wanna dump data on researchers. They have, Texas has a data warehouse of 30 years of data They've had a million Zoom hearings. They want to be sharing all those data points with researchers. So part of it is definitely policy. Part of it is legislative. But a huge chunk of it, I think, is various chief justices of state courts and federal courts believe in data. And they're realizing the huge power of actually understanding what's happening in their courthouses. Whereas in Canada, we, for some reason, don't have that same um, we don't have the same legislative or policy basis for what courts are doing and often um, it's a much more insulated or opaque process of how things are happening and why they're happening as they are. Great, thanks so much. Um, oh, we've got, so yeah, let's take a couple of questions if that's okay with you, um, John. The next question is, um, I understand that basic data is missing, but so are more complex questions. For example, how are the courts meeting the needs of equity seeking groups? Are the outcomes of punitive decisions leading to effective outcomes? How could data lead to evidence-based decision-making? Great question. Yeah, yeah, this is a great question. Uh, I think using the example, I mean, right now we're seeing, you know, more discussions of race and racism in our government, I think, than I've ever seen in, in my lifetime. And data on these subjects could actually help to have really empirical um, conversations and also empirical measuring of what's occurring where. So let's take the example. There's actually a hearing occurring in the Ontario Court of Appeal today about a decision where uh, a judge looked at the potential ways that black men have experienced aspects of racism in their life and how that um, fits into sentencing, similar for the way that courts do for Aboriginal offenders. But one of the big problems that is going to be, I'm sure this case whipped the Supreme Court of Canada, is you can't actually sit down quickly right now and say, what is the average sentence that occurs for certain offenses based on race, gender, and age, and then split it apart by judge, split it apart by region, and then split it apart by province. So if someone wanted to actually, and we have more of this data on um, Aboriginal and Indigenous offenders, and being able to actually track whether the interven intervention is working. And in the case of, for example, Gladue reports, since that approach by um, the Canadian government, and it's required for judges to consider it, a lot of the situation has actually got worse. So sometimes the intervention doesn't match what I think people are hoping for. But if you don't have data, you can't actually sit down and say, we're going to do this. And then we're going to look at um, what happens. And what happened with Aboriginal offenders, I think, is really unfortunate because it was a 10 year period in between the first time when the Supreme Court of Canada said you need to be examining um, the indigenousness of the offender and how their systemic barriers have affected the way that they've moved through their life and now they're sentencing. And then it was 10 years before the Supreme Court of Canada looked at it again and said, oh my goodness, the situation has actually got way worse. So what I'm proposing of having, you know, readily and available data where you'd have a you know, decision dashboard largely where you could just sit down and figure out these issues, you wouldn't have to wait for a huge systemic failure. As soon as you started seeing small failures, um, you could start in making in a data-driven or empirical intervention, but you could actually always be aware of the ways in which the system is failing. So right now, we don't know the ways in which the system is failing. And I think the issue today that's occurring in the court is the allegation for many interveners is that the system is consistently failing young Black men, but they don't have good data on that. So the, a lot of the conversation revolves around their anecdotal experience as defense counsel and the court's anecdotal experience of, as judges, rather than being able to sit down and say, here's the numbers, here are the outcomes, and let's figure out what are the ways in which these outcomes are occurring. Um, Florida right now, they passed legislation in 2018, they're going to be tracking the criminal journey of an individual once they enter, first interaction with the cop until 
they are potentially discharged from the criminal justice system. And they're gonna have 140 data points. So similar to what I've been saying, they're gonna be able to figure out exactly the ways in which the system is meeting the goals of success and the ways in which the system is clearly failing individuals in it. So when, uh, just to, to follow up on that, we said the, the data points is gonna be 140 data points. That's for, for a single, I guess, interaction or a single offender for lack of a better word. Yeah, I mean, it's very similar, and, and I don't mean to be crass with this comparison, but very similar to a user journey experience mm -hmm. that would occur in most tech companies now, where you're tracking the entire journey of a customer through their time at the company. What I think Florida is trying to do is have a situation where they can track the entire criminal justice journey of an individual who, who enters the state's control and figure out the ways in which you know disparity arises. What about intervention? So if you actually change something, you could see potentially the way that that journey changes for an offender. And thanks for to Chris for um, journey of the accused. Thank you so much for that. Um, for, for, for the correct terminology. And I think terminology is also incredibly important, especially because Absolutely. a lot of it is, is couched in uh, pretty uh, historically racist and um, uh, colonialist language as well. Um, let's take one more question. Um, there, it's very specific here. So um, to your best of your ability, which provinces in Canada have electronic dockets in public? Uh, Chris mentions Manitoba's Queen Bench has an online court repository, but limits search results. Is there an API? Uh, this data available? Do you know maybe for other provinces or even maybe at the federal level? So Manitoba Queens Bench does have the online. British Columbia has an online system. Ontario and Saskatchewan are slowly getting it. Uh, as far as I'm aware, no province has an API. Uh, the only kind of API that exists that's publicly available is with Canly, which is the kind of aggregate database for Canadian judicial decisions. And it's only for between five and seven metadata fields. There is some more work being done on this by the Legal Information Data Institute um, that will have a larger API. And I believe they're, they're potentially looking at some ways of having um, an API access for um, online court records. But that is, I think, something way in the future. Individuals who do have access to this um, are largely corporate entities such as Thomson Reuters, who owns both Westlaw, which is a large search engine, but they also own Case Lines, which is the new electronic document management system that Ontario just purchased and is using. Okay, great. That was, uh, those were great questions from the audience. Thanks so much. Um, I'm a little nervous about Thomson Reuters also just owning any kind of data. Um, I think we, we see that in the, um, in the academic market, what the transition from like, um, you know, owning publishers to owning data and how much more powerful that that uh, that is in terms of like what the, the value of that commodity. Um, so, but with that, um, it's now uh, 1246 here in the uh, Eastern time zone. So why don't we all take 10 minutes? We're gonna click the link to the Google doc that was provided by John. It's in the chat here at the top and um, if someone could just pop it in the chat again. Um, we'll head over there and see if we can use, again, some of the search terms that John provided and start to populate it. Just for 10 minutes, see where we get. And uh, let's meet back at, um, let's meet back in 10 minutes and we can discuss what we found. So see you in 10. Oh, wow.
Sorry, um, apologies. You might hear some extraordinarily loud drilling in the background, <clears throat> in the background, but I think I'm doing it wrong. Um, would you be so kind, John, and and uh, and help me out, perhaps? Because I, I'm putting search terms in the uh, in the search window, like empirical and whatnot, and nothing's coming up. Are you in Google, Google Scholar? Google, Google Scholar that uh, libguides. Oh, libguides that you see Merced Edu. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So again, I'm not sure what I'm. I might be doing wrong. Is not, nothing's coming up. All right, so I'll share my screen here. So I'm just going, let's say, policing, keeping my closed bracket with the quotation marks, the or in between. Um, and that gets me. There's definitely some down here that I would have to go through and take a look at. For example, this one here. Um, if I was to change out the end portion of this string and say, judge. That Sorry, gives I apologize. Me... Sorry, I apologize. Sure. I, was, I guess I was using the wrong link. I saw the I thought the libguides.uc Merced was the Google Scholar search window, but uh, Uh, John, you may see I've looked, uh, for, I found a website called Federal Judicial Appointments, and mm -hmm. they do seem to have uh, recent data sets, although not in any readable format. You'd have to translate it into a spreadsheet uh, for uh, who applied and who joined. Did you, I guess that you probably already knew about that one, right? The, on the Office of the Commissioner for Federal Judicial Affairs? Yeah, FJA. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I have, I have an email out to them as well to figure out if they have any data that they're willing to share about who applied or any existing data on demographic information of judges. Um, but that, that's a, this is definitely one of the better sources for getting a snapshot of what our judiciary is comprised of. Very good. Okay. I uh, also went to the federal court and I just <laughs> you have to search for the cases. So I searched by the party name Queen because I figured <laughs> a lot of them will have that and I got 3,802 so if one had the patience uh, or a machine learning tool one could scrape this <laughs> absolutely I mean that that's that's my hope this year hi it's Sabelle I'm I'm still a little thing because I was late because I couldn't get into the room for a long time I'm I'm a little bit lost about the focus of the data search like it's on uh, all across Canada and policing specifically. It, it would be any topic um, within that Google sheet that might have an empirical angle to it. So it could be policing, it could be terrorism, it could be criminal law, family law, um, any of the various things on, in that Google sheet on the left side under topic, there are a number of different terms that you could replace policing with within that um, suggested search framework with the parentheses and empirical data set. So if set. you end up with these data sets that cover that wide of a gamut, how, I, don't, I don't understand what that leads to in terms of the next steps or um, sort of outcome goals. I'm, I'm a bit lost where this is going. Yeah, so in terms of next step and outcome goals, I would be taking all of these existing data sets and either hosting them on my website or listing to where people could find them. 
And the goal of that would be to have an aggregated list of previous research that's being done so that people can either take those data sets and replicate the research or try to find ways to build upon and expand uh, those data sets. I see. So it's pretty open-ended. Pretty open-ended, yes. Is there an intent to eventually start to like mind map it a bit? Um, the intent would be that if uh, enough of these are gained, it would be to work with, I mean, I have no idea what the number of possible data sets is, but I've had some offers from individuals who work more in the information space on the librarian side to actually find out and find a way if there was enough data to create a, a data set or, or mass data set, or as you said, potentially mapping out um, the areas of coverage and lack of coverage. I think there are quite a few issues that have just never been empirically researched in Canada. So that would be another area where if we had a list or is able to map out and then now that we're starting to see more empirical research actually saying, okay, we need a big focus on let's say child protection orders in the family law context. John, oh, sorry, go ahead, go ahead. Mm -hmm. um, is there a jurisdiction that does this really well that provides a model on like, how to organize or structure this kind of search and uh, uh, structure of data? Like, is there, is there somebody, uh, a jurisdiction that's done this well that you could model? Uh, the States has done it somewhat better, I think, in terms of they have different data houses. So, for example, the Institute out of Michigan is called ICPSR. They host a number of data sets um, that are available to people who are in their membership. And then there are some just academic um, websites in the States that host existing legal data or list. Here's all the data on judges that we have in the federal system. Here's all the data on the state system. But I've yet to come across a site that really does a comprehensive, here's your one-stop shop for empirical data that academics have generated on a legal system. Uh, John, sorry, I, uh -huh. I need to break in for a second here. Uh, if you'll regard your chat, uh, there's a consideration regarding the recording. Okay. You have a pop-up window uh, behind the screen if you minimize your screen and it'll say, uh, where do you want it saved to once it's all finished rendering, okay? Yep, and I'll save that and put it in a Dropbox for you. Thank you so much. Sorry, I just wanted to ask you about New Zealand. You mentioned New Zealand. Um, are they, have they gone further with it than, than just sort of warehousing certain data sets or they? So one of the things that New Zealand has done, I mean, they're, they're releasing more, the government is releasing more public open-ended data about delivery times, for example, for judicial decisions. And in their current, um, they started, revisiting how they were going to reform their courts, I believe starting in 2016, and they've woven in legislative requirements for kind of human-centered design principles. And if they actually bring those to bear, one would think that they're going to be tracking and transparently releasing more data. But one of the main things that they're doing that I think differs from Canada is just this, they give a public benchmark of here's how long our judges take to issue decisions. Um, in these levels of courts. And if a judge fails to, then often the judge actually has to write a report. And I, I can't remember, I don't have it on the tip of my um, mind right now about whether that becomes publicly available as well. So mainly the, my focus, at least on the comparison New Zealand is more what the government is doing there rather than what's happening in the academic data um, world in terms of academic sharing and posting their data. And are they, are they doing that from like an indigenous um, lens as well? Like, are they looking at uh, discrimination in the courts uh, to Maori and such that that is more effective than what's happening here? I'm not sure. So Monica, I know at the time, I know you, sorry, you wanted yeah. to come back. At, yeah, Yeah. so I'm coming back. Thanks, John. Um, so uh, taking a look at the Google Sheet, it looks like we did get some people to start populating it. Um, so the intent also between, uh, by using the Google sheet is also so that, um, this is something that we can continue. So this Google sheet is going to continue to, um, live in, in that link. Um, so I invite you to continue this search. I'll say that there was clearly a lot of interest in this topic, John. Um, so thank you so much for, for, um, giving us your perspective and giving us, um, your insights that you've gathered through your um, 
your legal career, but also sort of the, the uh, graduate work that you've done. Um, we would love to have you again for us to sort of continue this, uh, this work. I think there's a lot of interest. Um, and so I'll just, uh, I'll leave you to you if you wanna leave any uh, parting words to our participants. Well, thank, thanks so much. And my, my website's deliberatelegaldesign.com um, and you can easily Google me as well, John Kahn, and you'll get a, a link to a, a landing page as well as that website. But thanks so much for having me and um, for the work that we accomplished and any other work that folks add to the Google Sheet going forward. It's a great pleasure, um, pleasure, pleasure and privilege to be able to join. Thank you, John. I just want to add that I'm going to give my email address uh, in the chat for everybody. And if anyone wants to follow up and, uh, in, in the sense that they're pursuing this uh, for the next week or two, then I'll be happy to uh, loop uh, you back in, if I may, and respond directly to any questions that I might. Okay. And uh, that'll also uh, let me uh, help people with uh, recording and such. There we go. There is my email address at opendatasociety.ca. And John, you're the host, so you can uh, conclude this uh, whenever you uh, like. And I'll make sure to save the recording. Thank you very much.